This lesson is sponsored by Wacom, the industry leader in high-quality digital art tablets. In the grayscale painting lesson, I included three reference photos that you can use for your assignments if you'd like to. I'll be doing demos of each of these references to help give you an idea of how I might approach painting them. Each one has some different challenges that will give you a variety of different problems to solve with your paintings. For this first demo, and the easiest reference, we're going to do another figure painting, similar to the one that we did in the lesson itself. The grayscale painting lesson focused on a pretty accurate and digital way of painting. I did a fairly refined drawing before getting into any kind of painting, and I also used some very controllable, predictable brushes in order to be able to render and get as close to the reference as I possibly could. For this painting, I'm going to try something a little bit different, and you can try this as well if you like. I'm going to use some brushes that are a little bit more difficult to control, and I'm also going to be making some creative decisions with the painting, rather than just copying the reference directly. Although I will be following the reference fairly closely, you'll see as we move along that I make a few fairly big changes to the painting itself, allowing myself some freedom to make the piece I want to make rather than just copying the photo. It's extremely important, both for studies and for creating original work, that we don't become slaves to our reference. The word reference really just means something to refer to. That is, the photo is there to provide you with information, you can choose to follow that information, or you can deviate from it, depending on your own creative goals. I'll start this piece off with a fairly similar process as the grayscale painting demo. I always like to start with a drawing, a loose gesture at first, and then slowly adding on forms and anatomy until I feel like I've got myself a good roadmap to paint over top of. A slight difference with this one is that I'm being a little bit looser and more exaggerated with the gesture. I'm using a bristle brush, which doesn't allow me to really dig into any kind of details, which is useful for this painting because I want to try and achieve a slightly more painterly approach with it. So I'll be solving some of my drawing problems in the painting itself, but I still want to start with a drawing to give myself some clear and accurate landmarks to paint over top of. I'm using the reference to guide my decisions, but I'm not copying it perfectly. And this is intentional. You can see that I've slightly exaggerated the gesture a little bit. His hip is a little bit more pushed out than it is in the reference. And I've also turned his head slightly to the right. This is why I recommend having a fairly strong grasp of drawing fundamentals before digging too heavily into painting, as you want to have the drawing chops to be able to make these kind of changes on your own. For this drawing, I really just want to get my general proportions and gesture correct. I don't need to define any of the details, as I'll be figuring those out in the painting later. This is a slightly more challenging way to work, but it's still good practice, so even if this is a little bit intimidating, it's worth trying out and see what you learn. Once my drawing is complete, I'm going to start toning my canvas with the digital oil painting brushes that were included in the grayscale lesson. Because I'm going for a more traditional, hand-painted look for this piece, I want to try to use an equally traditional process. A lot of artists are very interested in getting a more painterly or traditional look to their digital artwork, and a big part of achieving that is using a painterly, traditional kind of process. So, if I were doing this in oil paint, I would likely start with some kind of drawing, maybe fix it to the canvas with a spray, and then tone the canvas with a kind of burnt umber underpainting. Although I'm adding some color here, this is still going to be a grayscale painting. This is a fairly common academic way to work, where you tone your canvas with an orangey color, just to block in your general values and shadow shapes, and then paint over the top of it with grayscale. This might seem like kind of a waste of time. If we're just going to paint over all this color anyways, why should we add it now? And the answer is that because I'm going to be using these oil painting brushes, there will inevitably be some gaps between my brush strokes where little bits of this orange underpainting will peek through, which will add a nice touch of life, interest, and traditional paint feeling to this figure painting. 
After I've mapped in my shadow shapes, I'm going to go ahead and tone the background with a fairly dark color. This is the first major change that I'm going to make from the reference, as the reference has a mid-tone background where the lights of the figure are brighter than the background and the darks of the figure are darker than the background. I'd like to create a slightly more atmospheric painting here and let my shadows kind of bleed away into the background with soft edges. So in order to do that, I'm probably going to need a darker background. Establishing my background first will help me make better decisions about where the values of the figure need to go later, as if I paint the whole figure first and then paint a background around it, I might discover that the values of my figure don't really blend that well with the background. So starting by painting my dark background gives me context for how light the lights of my figure should be and how dark my shadows need to be to get that atmospheric feeling that I want. Once I've finished blocking in my background, I have good context that I can start adding values to the figure. I'm going to be carefully looking at the values of the reference, but not slavishly copying them. The reference actually has lighter light values than I'm adding here, and I've chosen to darken mine down a little bit, both so they're not too contrasty against the background, and also so I leave myself a little more value range to add highlights later on. I'm starting with just my light values here, as I feel like my shadow shapes in the underpainting are pretty close in value to what I'm going to need in my final painting. I'm still going to be painting over those, but for now, I'm really just separating light and dark. It's very important to clearly define what is truly shadow in your figure paintings, as one of the most common mistakes beginners make is seeing midtones as shadows and overdefining the rendering of various muscles. For example, with this reference, you might look at the abs and assume that each ab has a shadow, but if you kind of blur or squint your eyes, you can see that really only the right side of the abs actually falls into shadow, and the left side of the abs is actually just midtones. I'm staying zoomed out here and focusing on big shapes. This isn't about rendering, this isn't about detail, this is just about blocking in the major forms of the figure. I'm only really using two values here and occasionally blending the edges between them. I have a lighter midtone and a darker midtone, and they're pretty close together in value, probably only like a 10% value difference. So keeping my values very constrained in the lights will help keep them separated from the shadow shapes and make the light feel more like light. Another important thing to note, if you happen to also use these digital oil brushes that I've included, is that they function much like the dual-edged brush that we talked about in the very first lesson. These brushes have a hard edge on one side and a softer edge on the other side. So pay close attention to your brush stroke direction, as you can actually achieve a lot of edge control just by choosing carefully which direction you paint your brush strokes. I'm trying to really focus in on just the big shapes here. There's definitely a lot of smaller shadow shapes that eventually I'll want to add and clarify, but if I get into that too soon, I run the risk of losing the overall impression of light on the figure. So keeping this as simple as possible and just focusing on the value relationships between my lights and my shadows will give me a great base to refine on top of later. This is also a great way to get a more painterly feel to your work, as if you start with a very loose block-in, you can choose which areas you want to really refine, and by leaving some areas less refined, your final image will appear a lot more painterly. Now that I've blocked in my lights, I'm going to do the same thing and block in my shadows. I've chosen a fairly darker value to paint my shadows with. I want to be sure that every value in my shadows is darker than any value in my lights, so I made sure to go about two or three steps down with the value of my shadows. They're bright enough that I can currently see them against my background, but dark enough that none of the shadow values overlap with the light values. I also want to keep my shadows relatively simple compared to the lights. To get an atmospheric, painterly feeling to this figure, I'm going to need to choose where I want to put my information. 
If I make the shadows and the lights equally detailed, the figure will appear a little bit more flat and not quite as natural. But if I let my lights be more detailed and rendered, and let my shadows be more simple, then the figure will feel more natural and also more painterly. Once I've blocked in my lights and my shadows, and I'm confident with the values and the general edges and forms that I've established, I can zoom in a little bit and start refining the painting. Again, I don't want to go too detailed, as I'm trying to get a more painterly effect here. For a majority of this work, I'm using the same blending technique that we discussed before. I'm painting in values with my brush tool, then holding Alt to switch to my eyedropper, selecting the tone I want to blend with, and then gradually painting until I get the proper edge. This is possible because the opacity of this brush is controlled by my pen pressure, so I can get a lot of control simply by how hard or how softly I press with the brush. You can see as I refine this face here that I'm trying to really stay true to this idea that my information lives in the lights. I've left the shadow side of his face very simple and soft edge, barely even describing the eyeball that's over in the shadow side of the face. Keep it simple, stupid. Great advice. Hurts my feelings every time. I want to keep this mentality through the entire painting so that I can get a nice impression of light. Also, as I'm rendering, it's very important that I don't start increasing the contrast in my two value zones, the lights and the shadows. Occasionally, I'll need to make some of the midtones darker or some of the shadows lighter just to get the proper effect of light. But if I push any of that too far, all of a sudden, the figure will start to be broken up by too many small shapes of contrast, and I'll lose that great impression of light established by this clear separation of big light shapes versus big shadow shapes. As I get into this rendering stage, the dual-edged nature of this brush also becomes extremely important. It's actually quite difficult to properly blend with this oil brush, as it's very unpredictable and has a fair amount of texture to it, but that's exactly what I want. If I'm trying to paint something that feels more traditional, it's actually easier to achieve with a brush that's somewhat unpredictable, as whenever you're painting with watercolors or oils, there's always going to be some element of randomness or chaos that you can't control. Digital painting is fantastic for the level of control and accuracy it can give you, but sometimes that's simply not your goal, and you need to take control away from yourself by using tools that are slightly more difficult to use. As I'm rendering the torso here, I'm trying quite hard to keep my value ranges separate between the lights and the darks, but even with this in mind while I'm painting, I still do end up pushing these midtones a little bit too dark, and I end up brightening them later with a soft brush. Also, as I'm getting into painting these various muscles, I'm making some more creative decisions, as the reference itself has a lot of complexity and information and very small shapes and details in the muscles. There's nothing wrong with that, but for this particular style, I want to try and simplify those a little bit. I want to identify what the big shapes are and avoid adding any extraneous details that just add clutter and mess to the piece. This idea of creating painterly artwork can be a bit confusing and vague, but ultimately what the word painterly means is that you're editing and making creative decisions. You're not just painting something the way it is, you're choosing which parts of it you want to paint and leaving out parts that you don't want to paint. This is true for painterly artwork, stylized artwork, or anything that deviates from reality. A lot of artists think that painting extreme realism is the most challenging thing you can do, but it's actually one of the easiest once you start getting a proper handle of your tools and your fundamentals, as any time you want to paint realism, all you have to do is copy your reference extremely closely. Painting stylized artwork is actually significantly more challenging, as you have to make creative decisions about what you're going to include and what you're going to remove. While this figure painting isn't necessarily stylized in a cartoony sort of way, I'm still stylizing a lot of the shapes and forms to try and get something that feels more appealing to me as an artist. 
I'm simplifying some of the forms to try and get a clearer read, and I'm removing details that seem unnecessary in order to get cleaner, more appealing looking shapes. This kind of thinking will become extremely important once you start making your own original artwork, as you won't have a reference to directly copy, so although you'll have references that you're using for information, you'll still have to make these kinds of creative decisions and choose which parts of that information you want to use in your work. That's why doing studies like this on a regular basis is one of the most helpful things you can do for your artistic development. Not only does it help you develop your skills as you're practicing painting something with the help of a reference, but it also helps you develop your creative decision making. Exploring these different kinds of processes and styles with studies is a very safe and easy way to explore different techniques, different ways of working, try new brushes, or simply develop your fundamental skills. As I'm getting towards the bottom of the figure, I'm not refining the details as much. Since I want this figure to be more painterly, not only do I need to decide whether my information lives in the lights or the shadows, but also where on the figure is the highest level of information. Since the face and the torso are the more interesting parts of this figure, as is usually the case with figure painting, I'm trying to let the legs and feet be a little bit more simple. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in the spear handle, and even though I'm trying to get a slightly more traditional look to this piece, that doesn't mean I'm not allowed to use digital hacks. So in this case, I used the pen tool to create a nice clean selection for the handle of the spear. I put that on its own layer, masked it behind the hand, locked that transparency, and then I can simply paint the light on the spear very quickly. Now that I've got the overall figure pretty much where I want it, I can zoom out a little bit and just focus in on any final touches that I want to add. Cleaning up any edges, adjusting any forms that look strange, reducing contrast that have gotten out of hand, and I can make any large scale adjustments to really tighten up this piece and bring it to finish. This was a fairly quick and loose demo, but if you'd like to try this process for your assignment, feel free to take as much time as you need and refine it to whatever level that you feel happy with. In the next two demos, I'll show you some more techniques for grayscale painting and talk about some of the ways to approach the different challenges that those references provide. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you there. Thanks again to Wacom for sponsoring this lesson. I've been using their tablets for my entire career, and they're the industry standard in virtually all studios. For a seamless transition from traditional to digital art, I prefer their Cintiq tablets, which allow you to draw directly on the screen. For more portable or budget-friendly options, their screenless Intuos tablets are also a great option. Or the Wacom One, which is fantastic if you're just starting out and want to use a screen tablet. Whether you go big for a Cintiq or start smaller with an Intuos, Wacom tablets are the perfect way to get a natural and traditional experience when painting digitally. Additionally, the entertainment industry uses Wacom tablets almost exclusively, so if you want to work in video games or film, they're the best option to get started with. So thanks again to Wacom for their incredible tablets and helping to make this course possible. If you enjoyed this lesson, be sure to check out the premium course at proco.com slash digital painting. We have more premium only lessons and assignment videos that you can watch, practice with, and level up your digital painting. You can also post your assignments to the assignment section to get critiques from other students and potentially get featured in future critique lessons. So be sure to check out proco.com slash digital painting and begin your journey into digital art. Cheers.